Evolutionists have been touting vestigial organs as proof of evolution. They say that organs like the appendix and the tailbone are useless structures that can only be explained by evolution just because they resemble other structures found in other organisms. Imagine their surprise when these organs were actually found to have function, showing conclusively that there is no such thing as a vestigial organ. But that didn't stop evolutionists from removing perfectly functional organs from their unwitting patients for decades. How much needless suffering did they cause? Looks like evolution is a vestigial theory. So why haven't all these supposed scientists changed their dialogue yet? I had to investigate. When Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1859, the term vestigial with regard to biology didn't even exist yet. He did, however, describe many structures, such as the human tailbone and atrophied leg bones in snakes, as vestiges of far more developed tails and legs that would have been present in their ancestral lineages. The closest he ever came to calling any of them useless, however, was in describing the human tailbone as useless as a tail. And in fact, it is useless as a tail. The word vestigial first appeared and was defined in 1893 when Robert Wiedersheim published his anatomy book, The Structure of Man, listing 86 structures as organs having become wholly or in part functionless, some appearing in the embryo alone, others present during life constantly or inconstantly. For the greater part, organs which may rightly be termed vestigial. From its inception with this definition, the word never meant functionless, but Wiedersheim did list several structures for which there were no known functions. This list was later expanded by others to 180. The question was for many of them, and still is, what are their functions? The concept of an organ with no known function goes back to antiquity, as do surgical removals of these structures. Tonsillectomies are mentioned in Hindu medicine as far back as 1000 BC. Around the turn of the first millennium, writers such as Aulus Cornelius Celsus described the procedure for removing the tonsils in great detail. The first appendectomy was performed in 1731. Even the first removal of a tailbone, called a coxagectomy, was performed in 1726, over a century before Charles Darwin wrote On the Origin of species. Darwin's theory of evolution was not even formulated when these operations began taking place, and functions for the tonsils, appendix, and coccyx were already well known long before Darwin published. So no, evolution had nothing to do with any of these procedures. They were performed then for the same reason we perform them today, because the structure is endangering its owner's life or is causing them to suffer. What Darwin's theory did was to propose an explanation for these structures with or without function. Attempts to explain vestigial structures go back as far as the 4th century BC when Aristotle commented on vestigial eyes of moles and described them as stunted in development. In 1798, Etienne Geoffrey St. Hilaire, who accepted a Lamarckian view of biology, speculated on the origins of vestigial organs as well. Nature never works by rapid jumps, and she always leaves vestiges of an organ even though it is completely superfluous if that organ plays an important role in the other species of the same family. Charles Darwin began discussing what would be known as vestigial structures in On the Origin of Species. An organ serving for two purposes may become rudimentary or utterly aborted for one, even the more important purpose, and remain perfectly efficient for the other. An organ may become rudimentary for its proper purpose and be used for a distinct object. He expanded on this further in a chapter entitled Effects of Use and Disuse. In the sixth edition, Darwin even summarized his entire work by discussing how structures evolve chiefly through the natural selection of numerous successive, slight favorable variations aided in an important manner by the inherited effects of the use and disuse of parts. In that sense, it could be argued that nearly every living structure is a vestigial form of a previous structure that has lost its initial function while potentially developing or merely serving a different function. For example, according to the theory, the wings in birds and bats are repurposed arms. Likewise, mammary glands are repurposed sweat glands. This assertion of homology makes a prediction, which is that wings and arms will be coded for by modified versions of the same genes as will mammary glands and sweat glands. And when we examine the DNA for these structures, this is exactly what we find. This is also what we find when comparing the human tailbone to the tails of animals, the appendix to the cecum which digests tough grasses and animals, 
and the tonsils, which are coded for by modified duplicate versions of the genes coding for the thymus. Whether or not these structures prove evolution, the theory of common descent offered an explanation that holds true in its predictive power. Even junk DNA, which I covered in episode 82, was proposed to be vestigial in the same way. Both David Cummings and Susumu Ono published the defining works on junk DNA in 1972 showing an apparent lack of function, but proposing several functions that have later turned out to be true, such as buffering against mutations, fluctuations in intracellular solute concentrations, serving as binding sites for regulatory molecules, facilitating recombination, inhibiting recombination, influencing gene expression, maintaining chromosome structure and behavior, coordinating genome function, and providing multiple copies of genes to be recruited when needed. As David Cummings stated in his paper, these considerations suggest that up to 20% of the genome is actively used and the remaining 80 plus percent is junk. But being junk doesn't mean it's entirely useless. Common sense suggests that anything that is completely useless would be discarded. There are several possible functions for junk DNA. After the turn of the last millennium, comparative genetics, much like comparative anatomy, has shown yet another function for junk DNA as one of many sources for what have been called orphan genes. De novo genes which were said to appear with no apparent precursor or correlation in any other species. I will be covering this in more detail in a future episode on orphan genes, but this also highlights the breakthroughs that occur because of the implications of evolution as an explanation for vestigiality. For example, the function of the appendix had been unknown known for millennia. In 1507, Leonardo da Vinci proposed in his anatomical manuscript B that the purpose of the appendix was for contracting and dilating so that superfluous wind does not rupture the cecum. But this has obviously been shown to be false in the centuries since. In 2007, a team led by William Parker and R. Randall Bollinger used the assumption of common descent to determine the function of the appendix. They started by observing that the structures resembling the appendix were unique to mammals but had evolved 30 separate times. In fact, more than 70% of all primate and rodent groups contained species with a structure similar to an appendix. By examining these structures throughout the mammalian phyla, and specifically in rodents and primates, the team asserted that the human appendix could potentially function as a reservoir for the helpful bacteria which human beings depend upon for their digestion and health. Given that these bacteria have an increased chance of survival in a biofilm, the team predicted that biofilm consisting of beneficial bacteria would have to be present in the human appendix. In December of that year, the team published the results of that investigation and demonstrated that bacteria do, in fact, occupy the appendix in a biofilm. The team further examined the history of the appendix over time and discovered the reason why appendicitis had become such a problem in recent centuries. With the advent of sanitation and better medicine, diseases that wipe out bacteria in the gut, like dysentery or cholera, are now rare, leaving little opportunity for the appendix to actually serve its apparent function. Rather than having no function, the appendix appears to function too well, leading to appendix issues. Further research into this has shifted the first-line treatment of appendicitis toward antibiotics instead of immediately removing the appendix. There are multiple vestigial structures, and the functions of many of them are still unknown. Whether or not their functions are ever ascertained, lack of function is not a necessary condition for a structure to be considered vestigial. The assumption of common descent not only explains why vestigial structures exist, but through comparative anatomy, it also helps us to determine what they do and how we can better maintain them. Creationism may not have had anything to do with these breakthroughs, but examining the arguments around vestigial structures is another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.